In just a span of a century, the world has gone through miraculous breakthroughs in technology. Like the automotive industry, it has revolutionized transportation and opened a path to unreachable lands. But here's one a lot of people don't know. Many of the early vehicles couldn't show off their true power. These cars were in an environment mixed with public traffic and repurposed horse tracks. So enter the idea of a racetrack, a proper way to show off these new vehicles from the assembly line and demonstrate to spectators the speed this new machinery was capable of. My name is Jose and in this video we'll visit the Indianapolis Motor Speedway to learn about its history, design and influence on racing, earning it the title of the world's largest sporting venue. Welcome to On Tour, a channel dedicated to the design, geography, and history of America. And in the United States, it takes the crown for being competitive and breaking world records. Imagine being seated in the largest spectator venue on earth, where crowds roar and thunderously clap at the race cars going over 200 miles per hour in a venue called the Brickyard. That's one of the names this racing circuit goes by, which features some of the top races in the world. The legendary Indianapolis Motor Speedway is famous for hosting the Indy 500. It's a racing circuit in the town of Speedway, six miles outside of Indianapolis, the capital of Indiana, and it's currently the highest capacity sports venue on earth. The Speedway has a seating capacity of over 250,000 seats. That's almost 30,000 more seats than the famous Le Mans 24-hour racetrack in France. A radical idea brought to life by founder Carl Fisher. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway has inspired many racetracks across America, like Chicagoland Speedway in Joliet, Illinois. This speedway was opened in 2001 and has hosted many years of NASCAR races. Fisher was the owner of the first automotive dealership in the United States. And more than anyone, he saw the modern vision of racing tracks and fully testing vehicles in spectator arenas. Racing tracks of this era were mostly horse tracks and public roads, presenting significant dangers and challenges to the racers. Fisher envisioned the track as a showcase to display the power of the vehicles. But with so much interference between public traffic and terrain, spectators weren't really getting their money's worth when watching the brand new cars in action. Fisher was inspired by the up and coming racetracks of his time, like the current oldest racetrack in the world, Brooklands in the United Kingdom. But unlike Brooklands, Fisher laid out a blueprint for a circular track spanning three to five miles long and 100 to 150 foot wide surfaces. It was different than the pear shaped design of Brooklands, which had a banked out layout where vehicles inclined towards the inside of the racetrack. All the planning and research can be traced back to 1905, and the track didn't fully come to life until August of 1909, when they had their first automotive race. The racetrack wasn't a critical hit. The track was on a gravel road susceptible to potholes. The drivers were full of dirt, tar, and oil. On that first race, in front of an audience of over 20,000 spectators, Wilfred Bork suffered a rear axle failure, sending his car flipping over into a fence, resulting in the death of Wilfred and his mechanic, Harry Holcomb. In that same race, the co-founder of the Chevrolet Motor Company, 
Louis Chevrolet was a racer. Chevrolet also suffered an injury where a stone ricocheted from the ground, smashing his goggles and temporarily blinding him. Authorities deemed this track dangerous and unsafe, to which Carl Fisher challenged that he could make repairs within the next day. And that day two race was a lot more successful. No major injuries or accidents occurred. On day three, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway saw the events that would lead to its closure. 35,000 spectators attended this event to watch the 300 mile race called the Grand Finale. At the 175 mile marker, racer Charlie Murs blew a front tire. This sent Charlie's car out of control, in which he toppled several fence posts and ran over dozens of spectators. Two spectators would die from their injuries and his mechanic, Claude Kellum, died an hour later. Only 10 laps after this unfortunate incident, Bruce Keane struck a pothole and crashed into a bridge support. At this point, it was enough. The race was stopped and the remaining drivers were given engraved certificates instead of medals. The American Automotive Association boycotted any future events on this racetrack. Changes needed to be made to ensure the safety of the drivers. Imagine Carl's reaction, seeing his revolutionary idea get panned and condemned by the media, it left him no choice but to revise the dynamics of the racetracks. Enter the famous brickyard. How did Carl Fisher revamp his racetrack? Well, with the help of the state of Indiana. Five Indiana manufacturers supplied 3.2 million bricks, weighing 10 pounds each, birthing the legend of the brickyard. Fisher had tested the idea of laying down bricks to the racetrack because of its durability and what makes the revamping of the yard so much more interesting is the fact that each brick was hand laid and the final brick was made out of gold hand laid by the state's governor thomas marshall and the name brickyard comes from the locals after the redevelopment of the racing circuit Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the racing capital of the world. This is Indianapolis. The full racing venue returned in 1910 with short circuit races to prove its new safety structure. But its truly iconic moment came during Memorial Day weekend when a 500 mile race was showcased. That race would eventually go down in history and become the Indianapolis 500. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway has seen all types of different events in its history, from the Indy 500 and Formula One to the Grand Prix and NASCAR. The racetrack has become an American icon and definitive postcard attraction to the area of Indianapolis. And Carl Fisher's vision remains timeless, still maintaining the seating capacity put on paper way back in the early 1900s a pioneer to America's car industry and the world of racing.
Thank you for joining me on this fast-paced look at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a true icon for those who love cars and speed. I'm Jose, and if you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe, give it a like, and share. If you want to know more about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, please see the links below. Until next time.